Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Jody Gale with Utah State University Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, I'm also serving as the chairman of the Natural Resource and Aquaculture for NACAA uh, Committee. We'd like to welcome those of you that have joined us today and those that will join in the future. Uh, I will be making a presentation today, uh, representing our committee for NACAA's 365 webinar series. Uh, today's topic uh, is uh, we'd like it to be fairly informal. We've got a fairly small group today. So if you have questions as we go along, uh, you'd be welcome to jump in. I believe uh, Scott has uh, opened that uh, microphone up so that those of you that are participants uh, should be able to ask questions. Uh, today's topic is the Monroe Mountain Aspen Collaborative and Restoration Implementation on the Fish Lake National Forest. And uh, joining me today is uh, Mr. Tom Tippetts. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Tom to introduce himself. So I'm Tom Tippetts. I work for the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food as a Grazing Improvement Program Coordinator. My job is basically helping producers of livestock uh, design, implement, and fund um, range improvement projects, which includes uh, water collection, uh, vegetation manipulation, uh, fencing for control. This uh, GIP program is a relatively new program here in Utah in the last, uh, what's it been, maybe 10 or 15 years or so? 15 years, 15. yeah. It's been an extraordinary resource uh, for our permittees on public lands. Uh, by a little more way of personal introduction, I serve uh, in a split appointment here in Utah. I'm in central Utah. We're in the Richfield area. Uh, that's where I'm located. I serve as the Sevier County Ag and Natural Resource Agent. And I also serve in an area role doing ag-related economic development. So we're very pleased to be with you today and uh, hope that we might be able to share a little bit with you about uh, this uh, collaborative project. Uh, this is the outline that we'll go through. Uh, we'll uh, have this outline periodically through the presentation. We've got quite a bit of information to cover in usual extension fashion, probably more slides than, than we should, but would like to uh, kind of use this as our guide as we go through. We'll do uh, a little bit of background about this program, why we started, uh, uh, a little bit about uh, our first failed attempt, the role of the uh, Forest Restoration Working Group, kind of where we are presently with the successful Monroe Mountain Working Group Collaborative. Uh, talk a bit about research, uh, trying to keep everybody at the table, and then where we are with implementing this project. When I say we, this is a very large group. Uh, we'll discuss more about that in a moment uh, as we get into all of the partners that are involved. The U.S. Forest Service is primarily responsible to do the implementation but uh, funding comes from a number of uh, state and federal sources for this program. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the outcome and impacts of the program, some of the lessons that we have learned, and uh, some of the implications for uh, cooperative extension service, not only here in Utah, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, nationally, and hope that you might be able to uh, gain some of our experience with this program and being able to uh, uh, use it with, uh, with your programs. So a little bit about aspen. Uh, aspen are not trees. You think of a, a tree, an aspen-looking tree, it's actually a stem. Aspen are clones. And so they're part of, a, a, there's a massive underground root system uh, that uh, uh, really where the shoots or what becomes a tree originate from. Uh, clones uh, can really are really of an unknown age. They can be in excess of 50,000. Some estimates have maybe been as much as 80,000 years old. So they're very old organisms. The largest known organism in the world uh, is uh, the Pando Aspen clone, which is uh, here in my county in Utah. Though this project is not specific to the Pando clone, uh, we uh, have kind of that fame of the Pando clone is located here. So Aspen provides a, a great deal of forage and habitat for livestock, for wildlife, a lot of habitat for uh, all kinds of, of insect and wildlife species. And uh, when uh, Aspen uh, are uh, dominated by spruce and fir, uh, it, when it's uh, disturbed by fire or uh, uh, some type of mechanical treatment, it sends up a lot of new shoots from this massive underground root system. And that's referred to as regeneration, 
we'll hear a couple of terms today. We won't talk too much about regeneration. That's just simply the process of these new shoots originating from a root system after the, the tops or the trees or stems have been removed. But we will be talking a lot about recruitment. And recruitment is just simply the establishment of that regeneration to become a new stand of aspen trees. So uh, that's uh, just kind of know that there's a difference between regenerate or uh, regeneration and recruitment. So uh, here's a few uh, photographs of what uh, uh, functioning aspen uh, ecosystems look like where you have uh, sage, uh, brush, uh, 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 high meadow pastures, uh, grasses. Uh, you have uneven age uh, stems in the stand. You have the mature trees in the background, a new flush of trees growing here in the front. Uh, the slide upper or the photograph upper right, you can see where there's been a stand disturbing event sometime in the past. And you've got a good stand of young aspen that's coming back. Uh, lower left, uh, a fire, and you see uh, uh, sometimes upwards to 20 to 25,000 shoots per acre uh, will, uh, will come from the aspen roots that you can see there on the right. So the problem here in Utah is uh, with our aspen forest has been the lack of stand replacing disturbances either by fire or logging. And uh, the main problem was we're not getting recruitment. Again, remember, uh, 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 we'll talk a lot about recruitment is that's the establishment of the aspen shoots that are more than eight feet high, essentially where they're no longer overly uh, susceptible to herbivory from various ungulates. The main problem here by uh, with uh, not getting uh, aspen uh, uh, or aspen recruitment here in Utah is due to excess of herbivory, herbivory from ungulates. Herbivory is just simply a term to describe grazing by ungulates. Includes cattle, mural deer, elk, sheep, and so grazing is a major factor in the recruitment or the lack thereof of aspen stands here in Utah. And we began to see. Uh, recruitment stagnate in about the 1980s. This is an example of a stand that was not big enough, a timber sale, uh, was a couple hundred acres. Uh, Aspen has a lot of carbohydrates stored in the root system, but if you consistently graze off all those young tender shoots for about three years in a row, not being able to provide uh, an overstory capable of producing photosynthesis, those sugars and carbohydrate, carbohydrate reserves are depleted out of the root and the, the clone root system will die. So essentially you see the death of a portion of the clone or the entire clone if it involves the whole, whole amount. I might say back on the Pando Aspen clone, it, it covers some uh, uh, over 120 acres. So uh, you can have these clones occupy a great deal of space. Uh, we noticed that uh, with historic exclosures that had been built on the mountain that we were getting recruitment as long as they were fenced uh, and the excess of herbivory was the primary problem. Uh, a few uh, graphs, a lot of detail here, but just notice the yellow uh, slide on the, uh, the, uh, the yellow portion of the pie chart on the upper left. Historically, this is amount of aspen that was uh, on the mountain uh, in comparison to other uh, tree and vegetation species, so approximately 40% of the veg vegetation there was aspen, where currently, meaning in modern times, we're down to only about 10%. So this historic level would be roughly 150 years ago or maybe longer, uh, even getting into pre-settlement times. So if you look at the slides here on the right, uh, we have aspen trees uh, with uh, no recruitment occurring. And then uh, also the presence of spruce and fir, which come into the uh, spruce and fir likes to grow in the understory or the shade, of the aspen trees. But once they start to mature, then they will overtop the aspen and start to crowd the aspen out. Desired conditions on the left, where you have mature aspen trees are uh, up above, and then you have a new crop of uh, aspen to take their place whereas the two photos on the right is our current and actual condition on much of the Monroe Mountain. Here's an example of a functioning aspen ecosystem where you've got mature trees, uh, new crops of, uh, of trees coming along. I will use the term tree, even though they're considered to be a stem. 
uh, but you've got recruitment occurring and this is a properly functioning system. You have mid-age uh, mid stands, uh, you have a productive understory with grasses and forbs and young aspen. Here's one that's not functioning because uh, all of the aspen shoots have been removed through herbivory and uh, the trees uh, are getting very old. Most aspen trees are in their old age at about 80 years old and many are dying as you approach about 100 years plus uh, they begin to rot and fall over. Uh, here's another shot showing uh, where the conifers or the evergreens are encroaching into the aspen and the aspen uh, is being outcompeted by the other uh, species. Uh, here on the mountain, we're estimating as much as 1% per year loss of the aspen stands and as much as, uh, as 8, 000, or 8 million pounds of forage uh, production uh, are being lost uh, uh, on the forest. So the causes, uh, this is where we get into the crux of the problem that this extension program uh, was designed to address. Who's causing the problem? Uh, livestock versus wildlife or wildlife versus livestock. A lot of finger pointing. All animals uh, are uh, uh, grazing on the, the mountain. Uh, the I should say that here in Utah, as well as much of the Intermountain West, we are a public land state. So 68% of all of the acres in Utah are publicly or federally administered by the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, uh, uh, national parks and monuments, et cetera. And so uh, as a component of our livestock operations here in the West, we'll have private land, private grazing, uh, private forage production, but many of our uh, uh, cattlemen are, are referred to as permittees, where they'll have permits to run cattle on public lands. And so that's what's occurring in these high mountain areas where the aspen's present. So we have cattle, we have mule deer, we have elk. Uh, the elk numbers have been increasing substantially in recent years, and uh, all of them love aspen. So uh, a few uh, concepts here on the risks of doing nothing. Uh, only 17% of the soils on the Monroe Mountain that are capable of supporting aspen actually have aspen on those soils. This is uh, uh, from researchers with U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in years past, uh, Del Bartos and uh, Bill Campbell, who uh, developed that research. Uh, herbivory uh, on a small scale uh, uh, prevents uh, uh, establishment a recruitment of the clones, a couple of examples of failed uh, restoration efforts, including a timber harvest by Stoltz Aspen Mill that was less than 200 acres. Clone was lost after three years. We had a Mary's Peak fire, 2,500 acres, still not big enough. That clone was lost after three years. So the $64 question that the Forest Service, uh, the environmental community, uh, everyone has been asking is, how big is big enough to be able to overwhelm the ungulates? The goal was not to remove all of the wildlife from the, the mountain. The goal was not to remove livestock from the mountain. Uh, the goal was was uh, was to try and be able to overwhelm the, the herbivory that was occurring. Uh, we had the blame game. The environmental community was blaming the livestock producers. The livestock producers were blaming the, the wildlife, and there was really no data to support uh, uh, either claim. Uh, we just knew that herbivory was occurring, but uh, the risk of doing nothing is to increase uh, uh, ecosystem damage by failing to act. We have a number of private uh, uh, land in holdings on the mountain where you have cabin over, uh, owners and you have risk of destroying cabins through an uncontrolled wildfire. I won't spend very much uh, time with this slide. This is just a long list of the benefits that come by restoring Aspen. Uh, you know, uh, we have wildlife benefits, uh, livestock benefits, uh, removal of hazardous fuels, uh, improved uh, 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 ecological uh, uh, functioning systems for not only ungulates, but also for insects and a and, uh, uh, and, uh, number of other species. So we're going to shift to now and talk a little bit about our first failed attempt at collaboration. 
In about 1997, the U.S. Forest Service uh, really entered into this whole new approach of trying to uh, uh, get uh, or use collaboration as a way to solve problems on public lands. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, effort was referred to as the Monroe Mountain uh, Aspen Ecosystem Restoration Collaborative, which is different than the, than the collaborative that we've been part of uh, that we'll discuss more later. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM were spending about half of their budgets on uh, litigation uh, associated with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, if you're not familiar with it, as they would plan to do timber sales and do ve various vegetation treatments. Uh, most of these efforts were appealed and litigated <clears throat> by uh, the many groups in the environmental community. So they developed this new approach to try and get all of the stakeholders together, including the environmental community, to work together uh, to come up with consensus uh, and solve problems uh, instead of just uh, fighting it out in court. And I did put in the definition of collaboration. You can probably tell from the color of my hair that i am uh, been around extension for a while. And I remember as a kid growing up in the, in the early 70s <clears throat> that you'd watch a movie on TV and the term collaboration to me when I was growing up was not really working together. It was consorting with the enemy. Uh, so the, the first real definition of collaboration is working together by united labor, especially uh, regarding a literary or a scientific work. Again, these are kind of a text or a, a dictionary type definition. And then number two is the act of willingly cooperating with an enemy especially an enemy nation occupying one's own country. So to me, that's kind of what my, my uh, 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 early understanding in my life of the definition of collaboration was working with the enemy. That is not what this project has been, been about. Even though there's a lot of animosity between the environmental groups, the user groups, we've entered into this process to come as a way to work together, to collaborate together to solve problems and not just simply fight it out. So this first effort, all snake, uh, stakeholders were involved. We had some uh, good uh, facilitation. We spent, uh, met uh, sometimes twice a month for three years. Uh, unfortunately, many that were part of this process did not negotiate in good faith. And this uh, effort uh, that began in in 1997 failed due to a lack of, of being able to collaborate together. I will confess that I <clears throat> came out of that uh, uh, effort and experience after spending all of that time uh, rather cynical. The old saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And I was not particularly interested in trying to do that again after all of that effort. Uh, switching forward to 2007, so jumping forward quite a few years, uh, the establishment of the Forest Restoration Working Group. Uh, this uh, group was uh, again designed to foster collaboration and consensus to address critical forest issues. The issues have not changed on the forest. Uh, uh, the problems were still the same and getting worse as far as Aspen continued to deteriorate, fuel loading increase, increasingly uh, expanding and the risk to uh, end holdings was growing. Large group of members representing multiple stakeholders and multiple interest groups. A forest Restoration Working Group came together and uh, developed the Aspen Guidelines. And I can see one of my slides is not working well here, but they developed the Utah Forest Restoration uh, Working Group Aspen Guidelines published in 2010. Oh, there it is. Uh, this is available through Digital Commons at Utah State University. And uh, it was basically a, a working document to help uh, the Forest Service and all of the other groups come together to try and help restore Aspen on the mountain. Uh, they knew that they were up against a, a, a lot of uh, 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 a huge problem and the guidelines were never intended to fix and solve all of the problems on the mountain. But it was designed as, a, as an aid to help forest managers and, dis and decision makers on the mountain. Uh, switching to the next effort, uh, beginning in 2010, <clears throat> uh, came together 
uh, uh, the second attempt at a serious collaboration on the Monroe Mountain. Uh, this one was titled the Monroe Mountain Aspen Working Group Collaborative. It's been very successful and we'll spend the remainder of our presentation talking about that. I'll uh, defer to Tom. Tom is currently serving as the co-chairman of uh, the Monroe Mountain uh, Collaborative along with uh, Mary O'Brien, uh, who uh, has recently retired and been part of Grand Canyon Trust. And so uh, their leadership, along with facilitation by Dr. Steve Daniels, uh, also a retired extension specialist from Utah State University, uh, have been part of this new group. So, Tom, if you want to kind of explain our, the story. So I came uh, in, became involved with this Monroe Working Group at the very beginning as a member of the group, no, not as the co-chair at first, um, representing the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. Started in 2010. and. Um, there were there were a lot of people uh, later on in the you know first couple of months they would ask me you're you're a grazing guy you're you're dealing with livestock why are you involved with this tree problem basically uh, they felt like aspen was a tree problem it wasn't a livestock problem why was I involved and if you remember back on a few slides a major problem on Monroe Mountain was the overtopping of conif by conifer trees in these aspen stands. When conifer trees overtop an aspen stand, they reduce the amount of uh, understory that's there. A lot of the understory is grasses and tall forbs. That produces a lot of forage for many uh, wildlife and livestock on the on the mountain. We were losing about 10 percent or one. Uh, we lost about uh, eight million pounds of forage over the last hundred years on this mountain because of this overtopping of conifer trees. When we first started this collaborative. Um, we wanted uh, we wanted consensus, and and what we found out really quickly was not everybody had the same background, and not everybody had in their mind the same places on the mountains. When we talked about uh, issues like grazing or conifer overtopping of aspen, or what we called those blinker sites, those aspen sites that uh, didn't have any conifer in it, but they were not regen regenerating, and they had kind of a see through stand, nothing was was coming in and the old ones were tipping over. We did not have the same idea or the same picture in our mind. And so what uh, the greatest success I feel like of this collaborative was we spent several days, went on the mountain, looked at lots of different places, took all these people, uh, 25 or 30 when we're all said and done. And we went and looked at places and everybody had their say of what they were seeing livestock producers were looking were saying what they were seeing environmentalists were seeing talking about what they were seeing uh wildlife biologists were talking about what they were seeing and uh that gave us a common mindset or at least a common picture when we went back into our meetings down in town we uh we could at least draw on um common events or common experiences when we talked about things I'll let you continue on, but I, in my per personal opinion, that was one of the, the greatest things to set the stage for this collaborative working group. I, I share those sentiments. Uh, it gave us an opportunity to develop relationships uh, uh, on picnics and around lunch and 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 uh, standing on the mountain and looking at things. Uh, the opportunity to develop relationships was fostered in that type of an environment. Or normally we were just all, you know, different groups don't get together and talk. The collaboration provided that opportunity to, to talk, to develop relationships, to, to better understand the point of view of, of everyone that was involved on why they had this particular position or what they wanted. And that formed the foundation <clears throat> of the, the collaborative. Uh, Dr. Steve Daniels, a master facilitator, established ground rules. And as part of those ground rules, uh, you just simply couldn't say no and stonewall the whole group. If you didn't like something, your responsibility was was to come up with an alternative idea or concept or a plan that could be presented to the group. And it became a back and forth discussion. We literally spent four years in the, in field trips and and uh, meeting monthly in in offices or in the conference room here in Richfield. Uh, to get to a point where <clears throat> we understood one another's point of view and came up with consensus to be able to move forward. Here is a list of uh, all of the groups involved. 
<clears throat> just as a point of reference, so we are in the uh, central southern part of Utah on the Richfield Ranger District. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, area on Monroe Mountain represents approximately, uh, if I remember right, Tom, about 350,000 acres of uh, of uh, all types of uh, 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 ecosystems across the top of the mountain above the valley. <clears throat> this uh, gives a little bit of an indication of the different species there of spruce. Uh, the yellow is stable aspen, and so we have all kinds of species that are mixed on the mountain. So again, the root problem was overbrowsing uh, over or excess herbivory by cattle, deer, sheep, and uh, elk and sheep, and, uh, and uh, they were all part of the problem. So uh, we, uh, in order to really move forward, uh, the decisions of the group were we really had to do some research. What were the numbers? Uh, you know, everybody had kind of assumptions they were working off, but uh, we, uh, we needed to actually do some studies uh, uh, not only amongst the group that were represented there, but with Forest Service and others uh, to be able to better understand the, the process. And doing that supporting research was very literally like herding cats. It was a way to try and keep everybody at the table, uh, the environmental community, uh, the permittees, uh, the Forest Service, those from Extension and Tom and uh, with the Utah Department of Ag and Food, Rocky Mountain Research Station, Forest Service and others, uh, Bureau, uh, 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 Dr. Sam St. Clair at uh, BYU, we're all part of the machinery of doing some research. So we're going to go through this next uh, part of the presentation fairly quickly. We're going to just describe briefly some of the studies we did. But uh, first thing we did is to came, came in to see, uh, to measure the amount of, uh, of herbivory that was occurring. And uh, here's a few numbers on various research across the, the, the top of the mountain. And in some places, uh, the terminal browsing of these young aspen shoots, we were seeing over 90% browsing on those shoots. So there's no run wonder we weren't seeing recruitment because everything was getting nipped. Uh, everybody was pointing fingers. It's the wildlife problem that is causing the problem, or it's the cattle. And uh, so we decided we needed to figure out what was uh, actually eating the aspen. So we initiated a trail cam study uh, we had uh, 100 foot long transects. I'm showing inch, inches there on that slide. I'm just realizing that's a mistake. That should be 100 feet and six feet, not inches. But the purpose of the study was to determine uh, which animals were doing the grazing and what they were grazing on. A lot of information here in these tables, uh, just to orient you. Um, uh, this is work that was done in 2011 and 2012. The bottom slide is from 2012. This is where we had a trail camera that was established on each end of a transect, 100 foot long transect. The cameras were pointing in towards each other, measuring the activity that was occurring within the transects. We had four transects. Uh, this uh, first uh, column here is the number of triggers uh, of either videos or photographs that were taken. And then uh, we measured the number of amount by beef by deer, by elk. Uh, we had not a lot of sheep in this unit, so we didn't have uh, specific triggers from sheep in this particular study, but uh, you can see uh, everything was eating the aspen. It wasn't just the cattle. It wasn't just the elk. It wasn't just the deer. In relatively equal proportions, uh, uh, all of the animals were eating the, the aspen, and that way the Environmentalists couldn't blame the cattle as being the primary problem or the permittees blaming the wildlife as being the primary problem. We established that it was uh, all species. Uh, just another slide showing uh, similar things, but this one shows the species that they were tending to prefer. And so beef tended to prefer grass, deer tended to prefer a mix of grass and, as uh, grass and aspen, and kind of the same with elk. And so uh, not uh, great preferences, but there, in the end, the study showed that uh, all of the species were active and, uh, and they were all uh, actually grazing together. Contrary to popular belief, some here in the West believe that deer and elk and cattle will not uh, graze together in the same location. We have numerous photographs. We had over 66,000 photographs as part of the study, and many of the photographs shows that they were grazing 
simultaneously at the same time. Uh, Tom was part of a project to look at uh, uh, the animal unit months or or uh, the permits on the mountain, and uh, Tom will go through and explain this part so of the information. One of the questions that came up, or one of the positions that came up was, there has been an increase in the use of the mountain over time. We saw that there was de degradation across the mountain in certain areas, and, and one of the one of the uh, positions was there must be must much more use than there used to be. So what I did along with several other people, one was another uh, extension specialist, we went to the Forest Service and pulled out the old records out of the permits and we got actual use. So we had day on, number of animals, day off. So we were able to calculate AUM usage over time. We had really good data back to the 1930s. We had uh, uh, pretty good about half of the units uh, data back to 1920 and a little sparser data back to 1910, but it really, we were able to fill in some missing areas, but we really had a hundred years worth of data for livestock use on that Monroe Mountain area. We saw that in the 1910s and 1920s, we had a lot of use on livestock. And over time that reduced uh, steadily until the 1980s. And then it was pretty steady from there the, the, the livestock use now we switched a little bit from cattle to sheep or from sheep to cattle in those early years but pretty stable um in the in the 1960s to 2010 for livestock use on the mountain but then the next question was how much life or wildlife was out there we were uh able to get really good data back to 1960 and then a little sparser data uh back to 1930 but if you look at that 1960 graph we had a lot of deer on that mountain and we prob we probably had deer all the time and even into 1910 but we could easily say that at least 20,000 AUMs were taken off that mountain every year for the last 100 years and sometimes up to 30,000 AUMs we had a introduction of of elk in the 1970s into the Monroe area. First, it was a few animals, but then by 1990 and 2000, elk was a major wildlife species up on the mountain. But that, again, you can look there, 1916 and 2000, uh, almost 30,000 AUMs of, uh, of use on the mountain by either wildlife or livestock. So uh, moving forward, that's uh, pretty well the description of the, the problem. We want to uh, jump into the implementation phase. Uh, beginning in 2015, uh, the U.S. Forest Service completed its environmental impact uh, statement, uh, and we'll describe a little bit about uh, how that occurred, and that began the implementation, implementation phase of the project. So in typical fashion, the U.S. Forest Service uh, uh, studied a number of various alternatives as part of a committee, uh, especially the scientists on the committee, we developed some aspen thresholds to be able to uh, measure uh, and provide some baseline on what constituted success in these non-fenced areas. And this is an example of the type of information that that uh, that uh, was assembled by that group. Uh, here's uh, alternative five that shows the amount of acreage involved in uh, in in this particular proposal. Uh, the primary environmental impact statement specified there would be mechanical treatment and there would also be prescribed fire treatment along construction of temporary roads and temporary fences in order to put all of this together. Uh, this is uh, just to gives you a little bit of an indication of how prescribed fire would be done during a, uh, hopefully a controlled scenario, all of this being done by the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, the prescribed fires are typically accomplished in the spring uh, before we have uh, very flammable conditions on the mountain or in the late fall uh, to try and prevent the risk of, uh, of fires getting away. Uh, part of the idea for prescribed fires, you can come through and burn the aspen stems as well as the conifers that have overtopped and encroached in the aspen, but the aspen will come back. So that's very much uh, the foundation of these treatment uh, methods. Uh, so uh, a lot of information here that I won't spend a lot of uh, time on the on detail, uh, but uh, 
these were various scenarios that the Forest Service, working with the Division of Wildlife Resources, worked through uh, to accomplish the prescribed burning, uh, the mechanical thinning, and then also to be able to exclude uh, wildlife and cattle to give the aspen a chance to establish uh, and get to a point of recruitment. We have built uh, uh, many miles of fence that were designed to be temporary fences lasting maybe four or five years is all where that fencing could later be removed after the aspen has had a chance to recruit. Uh, resting livestock for two to three uh, growing seasons. All of these are various parts of the management process uh, designed to give the aspen a chance to regrow on the mountain. Any comments here, Tom, to add to it? Not at this point. Okay. Uh, again, uh, some of the benefits uh, that the Forest Service has listed, uh, and I won't uh, go into the details on, on them, but it all resulted in the completion of the uh, environmental uh, impact statement, which was approved in December of 2015 and really began, uh, began the process. And I'm happy to report that we are now in the eighth year, beginning 2013, will be in the eighth year of implementation of all of these mechanical treatments and prescribed burning on the mountain. Uh, some mapping that shows uh, mixes of uh, where uh, fire and mechanical uh, treatments have been accomplished. And uh, Tom will spend some time talking about uh, his extraordinary efforts in being able to keep permittees on the mountain, even though the various pastures had to be rested, the goal was to keep the permittees on the mountain. So this map shows uh, the major uh, livestock um, allotments on the mountain overlaid with the treatments that were going to happen. You see that uh, the large portion of the treatments were going to be in the middle part of the mountain and they're going to continue on in the north part of the mountain. So uh, because of the uh, Forest Service policy, when vegetation was disturbed, either by uh, prescri prescribed fire or mechanical 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 treatments, we need to leave those undisturbed by livestock for two growing seasons. So if they went and did that big blob of uh, mechanical treatment there in the middle of the map, uh, that per that permittee, the, the guy that had that allotment, was going to be required to stay out of that area for two years. That was a major part of his allotment. So these are the uh, the red represents the permittees that were willing to work with us. Not every permittee was going to be affected. Not every permittee was going to be affected the same way. And some of them opted not to kind of participate with us. But the red is the areas that the permittees were willing to work with us. Those small red areas, uh, red lines are the pastures within uh, several allotments. Go to the next one there. This is a rough map of uh, the areas that we were going to really focus our efforts on, that we were going to try to keep those permittees whole in that they were going to stay on the mountain with the permitted numbers of livestock for the permitted time, even though they may not be in the exact same spot that they were historically in. So we first came up with different ideas. Okay, how can we move livestock around, accommodate uh, mechanical and prescribed fire treatments, and still be able to rest areas that need to be rested, and use areas that we could use with the livestock that was permitted. This was one of several different types of rotations we brought up. It's a little bit confusing, but we basically had two different herds. The blue arrows are a herd of one cattle, the green arrows is a herd of other cattle, and then that orange or tan line is a, a sheep band that would be able to move through those areas. So the um, areas that are white were gonna be pastures that were gonna be used by something. Mainly, cat, mainly cattle. The green were pastures that were going to be totally rested. And so those areas where we were going to be resting in this particular situation was going to be areas that had some treatment, either mechanical or, or fire. And the yellow ones were going to be areas that were going to be used only by sheep. And the significance about that is that sheep come onto the mountain two months later than life, uh, uh, cattle. They come in July 1 and they leave a little bit early about the end of, about the middle of September where cattle leave uh, about the end of September, 1st of October. So what that really said is we can use the, the mountain, those areas with the amount of uh, permitted livestock for the permitted time. We're just gonna have to change where they're at in time. Now, there are some things infrastructure wise that need to be implemented that we could do that. And this map shows all the different types of infrastructure that needed to be implemented. 
There's the Rock Springs pipeline in conjunction with the Box Creek pipeline. There's a, a rim seat pipeline extension. The Thibodeau Spring, uh, Spring pipeline was another uh, water source that needed to be developed and, and implemented. We needed to put in some fencing. Some of it was because those areas were going to be disturbed. Fire might burn them up. Or the areas were dark timber and there was no fence there, but that dark timber was what was uh, controlling cattle. So if we burned out the dark timber, those cows no longer had anything that was going to stop them from wandering into the next allotment. So the next slides that we have here are some pictures of those implementations. This is uh, solar panels that we uh, power, power as a solar pump in the Box Creek area to, to deliver water to the pipeline and in the re, uh, resulting pipe uh, water troughs of that area. This is the permittee that actually did some of the work himself. He actually hauled this storage tank up the mountain, which was quite, quite a rodeo. You can see that tank hangs off that uh, 16 foot trailer by like 10 feet and some of those switchback uh, roads. He, he, he had a, <laughs> he had a fun time getting that thing up there. That next uh, uh, picture is uh, some of the water troughs that we put in place to scatter cattle and be able to provide water in areas that typically were not well watered. But when you put a bunch of cattle in an area that may not have a lot of water, we needed water there to hold them. We have a lot of uh, what we call stock tanks or stock ponds that holds runoff water or monsoonal rains. Uh, those needed to be cleaned out, silt needed to be cleaned out, and they needed to be lined with bentonite clay so they would hold water over time. And so this is a, a cleaned out water pond. And we also implemented or in uh, installed fencing. Some of it was not easy fencing. This is a this is through a little cut that you can see that we had to. It's not easy country to get to. We had to cut out a, a, a fence line area and then go in there with uh, basically manually digging post holes and string and wire. So uh, with all of the infrastructure improvements, uh, as the implementation really uh, started to uh, move forward, <clears throat> uh, we were able to, the permittees were able to rely on uh, the, the great work from Tom and the Utah Department of Ag and Food to be able to keep them on the mountain uh, while uh, these massive treatments were being implemented. On any given year, I think some years we were treating uh, two to 3,000 acres per year and uh, all of the associated challenges of dodging those efforts for a couple of years. So a typical response come through with a fire. Uh, you get uh, immediate response from the aspen shoots sometimes uh, 20, 25,000, maybe even 30,000 stems per acre uh, 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 erupt from those root systems uh, to restore the stems. Uh, here are some that have been grazed as they're coming out of the ground. And the goal was, was to overwhelm the ungulates by treating big enough areas. We knew that 200 acres wasn't big enough. We knew that 2,500 acres in one year wasn't big enough. And so by going to 2,500 to 3,000 acres year after year after year, we were finally able to get ahead of, uh, of the ungulates. Yes, uh, fencing was done. Uh, typical uh, livestock fencing to separate uh, pastures. Uh, this is more of a cattle fence. It wouldn't keep out deer elk. Uh, larger fences like this were built, uh, some of them temporary uh, for maybe uh, three, four years, and then they would be removed once the aspens had a chance to recruit. An area here is showing some photographs, no fencing on the left in June and the same location in late August, again with no fencing and an obvious amount of herbivory. But uh, through the guidelines that were developed at the thresholds, uh, we had some sense of uh, we had uh, been able to, uh, even though there's quite a bit of her herbivory occurring, there was still enough aspen left to be able to get recruitment. Uh, more images of kind of the same uh, same type of scenario, uh, uh, fencing in late August uh, uh, versus no fencing uh, in, in July. So shifting to the outcomes of the project, uh, here's kind of the, the, the summary uh, uh, of the project. We received consensus. We herded the cats long enough, we were able to keep them together. There was no appeal on the EIS. There was uh, the NEPA uh, uh, EIS was not appealed or litigated. We had the record of decision in, in December of 2015 uh, that we mentioned previously. We're treating approximately 41,000 acres of aspen on the mountain. 
We're now in the eighth year of implementation. We've mechanically treated uh, about 6,000 acres. We've prescribed, fired, uh, treated about 14,000 acres. We're about half done, 51% um, uh, will, of the remainder will mostly be treated with prescribed fire. Lots and lots of ongoing research uh, from all kinds of exclosures and uh, small site and long site uh, 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 scale uh, exclosures. This work is primarily being done by Dr. Sam St. Clair at uh, Brigham Young University, who's been an, an important research partner with this project. Uh, much fencing has been uh, established and we've spent, when I say we, this is funding from the taxpayers in Utah, uh, Joint Chiefs funding from the U.S. Forest Service, and a number of sources. We've spent approximately uh, $13.5 million uh, as of the end of last year uh, to do this work. So uh, switching to kind of our finally, uh, final few slides here on our lessons learned. Uh, I'll go back to my statement uh, where I was fairly pessimistic. I did not think this second attempt would be successful. Fool me once, shame on them. Fool me twice, shame on me. But in extension, we usually don't give up. And that's kind of the, the part of the take home message here. Whether it's a little project you're working on or a big project where there's a lot at stake, like on this one. Don't give up. Uh, uh, find ways to uh, to collaborate or work together. Persistence is uh, is kind of the name of the game and playing the long game. In extension, we talk about impacts. And if we're going to make significant impacts, we've got to keep our eye on the long game if we're going to be successful. And there's also the risks and nothing ventured and nothing gained. So implications for cooperative extension, it is possible. Uh, to accomplish the classic role of cooperative extension, which is to extend the research-based resources of the university to the people. Uh, people have enormous problems. You think of global warming and, and uh, uh, society problems uh, of all kinds. Uh, we have enormous problems in our world and uh, in our respective counties, and we can uh, make a significant impact in addressing those problems. It's important to take the needs, not necessarily the wants, but take the needs of the people back to the university. And then the university can move forward with research and programs to help address those needs. Let me, let me, I need to talk a little about that needs, not wants. And I, I represented the permittees there. And what, um, let me back up just a little bit. We had repeatedly said that uh, we were losing aspen because mainly because overtopped of conifer whenever we had a a disturbance of some kind we got an enormous amount of flush of growth but they got grazed down to almost nothing if it was small areas they basically lost we came in basically as a second time and invited the permittees to come in and what they really wanted was us to leave they did not want us to be there they wanted the, the project to end what they needed with somebody to be able to show them that when when disturbance happens, there's a flush of growth and you get a, a corresponding amount of flexibility in your livestock operation because you have more forage there. We kind of, in some instances, drug them along kicking and streaming to this result. In 2015, I don't think, I don't think very many permittees wanted us to be there. They wanted it to end and uh, they didn't see much value in what we were doing. We had a drought uh, in this area, uh, basically from 2017 to 2022, we had one wet spot in there, but basically that was a, a extended drought. Because of the work that we had done with being able to supplement uh, water in different places that cattle weren't being able to move cattle and livestock in areas, maybe they weren't uh, um, historically in and the treatments happened, they were able to stay on that mountain with the amount of uh, permitted livestock for the permitted amount of time through a drought where lots of people had to take cuts. It was a few years, but in 2022, uh, I had a couple permittees say, you know what? I didn't think this was going to work. I wanted you to leave in 2011. I wanted you to leave in 2015, but today I'm glad we did it. So really we needed to take uh, their needs, not their wants, identify their needs, show them how we could help them and accomplish that. Yeah, yeah. 
I uh, I will never forget the meeting over in Kusharam one night with the permittees where where there was uh, literally you had to grab elbows and shoulders to keep uh, people from a fist fight. And so this has been a very stressful uh, 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 program for everybody involved. And, and we have been dragging the environmental community along as well. Uh, it's yeah. been a collective effort to drag each other along. For Mideas, the environmental community, we had two different representatives of the environmental community. One, uh, it got to a point where their executive office would no longer let them collaborate or compromise, and we lost them part way through. Uh, but the Grand Canyon Trust uh, stuck it through to the very end, and largely due to their work, as well as all of the other members, we were able to have a successful collaboration. And uh, here we are all of these years later with uh, with uh, good things being done to restore Aspen on the mountain. We're in the eighth year. The original idea was to be done in about 10 years, but it will extend beyond the 10 years to some degree. Probably closer to 15, but we're halfway done. Yep. Of the 41,000 acres identified, we've done yep. about 20,000 yep. acres. We're about, about half there. And uh, one additional thing that uh, Jason Kling reminded me of, he's the uh, the district ranger here on the Forest Service uh, is looking at an email from him last night. Not only is this collaboration benefited this Aspen project, but the collaboration has benefited an additional environmental impact statement uh, that's been accomplished not only just the Richfield district, but the entire Fish Lake National Forest, where needed uh, pinion juniper work is going to be accomplished on over 350,000 acres of uh, Forest Service uh, land. And I know that the Bureau of Land Management and, and other uh, land uh, agency holdings such as Sitlin and others are involved in those efforts. So this collaborative experience has not only benefited this one project, it's had far reaching implications uh, for uh, the management of the entire Fish Lake National Forest. And I was very interested to learn uh, just a about a week or so ago, the same effort is being expanded onto the Boulder Mountain to some degree. Uh, there's been a number of other collaborative groups that have been formed that are being patterned after the Monroe Mountain Group. So my last point right there, partnerships are critical to the role of cooperative extension. And we have that unique opportunity as an independent research-based educational entity to bring stakeholders uh, together, irregardless of what the problem is, uh, to collaborate through uh, facilitated collaborative processes, uh, to work for consensus and come up with solutions. Uh, you know, if you read newspapers and follow social media and watch the news, uh, our, our world, especially our country, is so divided with with uh, everybody uh, kind of in their silos and and fighting against uh, various issues. And uh, this has been a very career rewarding experience for me and for I think everybody involved that people who have polar opposite positions on things can come together through properly uh, organized, properly uh, uh, facilitated uh, and everybody uh, staying at the table long enough to work together. I will say hands off to, or uh, uh, hats off to Dr. Steve uh, Daniels, our uh, former extension uh, specialist. Uh, he is a masterful facilitator, and I think uh, had the skill set necessary to really keep such a diverse uh, group of stakeholders together. By, by far and large, it was everybody was heard. You know, yep. it was yep. environmentalists were heard, the producers were heard, the timber people were heard, the, the property owners within the inholdings were heard, the wildlife people were heard, uh, everybody was heard, and, and uh, those issues were addressed. Yes, yep. Great point. Uh, we're uh, got a few minutes left here. Uh, Scott, we'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, haven't heard any asked to this point, but would be happy to address uh, any questions from the group. I haven't been looking at chat here. Let me uh, close out this uh, presentation and uh, just chop, chop see, uh, down there and see if there's anybody in the chat. 
nope. not seeing any in the chat. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate uh, Tom uh, coming and spending this time with us at uh, uh, Utah State University uh, and especially NACAA, our national organization for county agents, and uh, sharing a, a bit about a successful program that we hope that you might be able to uh, find a few tidbits to help you uh, bring success in the programs you're involved in. Thank you.